Hi, I'm Tim Ronick from Axon Nobel, and I'm currently a board member with the SCRS. And we're here today to talk about corrosion protection. And uh, part of that conversation is all of us discussing it, and I'd like to pass it off to Toby Chess to be able to describe for us exactly what that is. Corrosion protection is a term we use in the industry as being misused. It is a we use it as a line item and that is incorrect. We need to look at corrosion protection as a process. Corrosion protection uh, over the entire car might be one item or it might be multiple items depending on the type of repair. For example, if we're fixing a fender, we might only use one or two type of items versus a quarter panel, we might use eight or 10 items. And these need to be listed on our estimate as separate items. That's a great point, Toby. So let's, let's maybe go down through and list the, you know, the most common items that would uh, be used to help restore that corrosive protection properties in, in a vehicle and, and we'll just kind of unpack it from there. So, you know, we can start with, uh, you know, weld through primers. If you're replacing a quarter, you've got uh, edge primers, epoxy primers, there's seam sealers, there's cavity waxes, there's penetrating corrosion inhibitors uh, as, as some companies sell. I mean. What, am I forgetting anything there, or is there something you'd like to add to that? Why don't we just break down and let's look at the weld through primers first. Okay. Um, weld through primers, we have two on the market, one being copper and the other being a zinc. Um, there are uh, good and bad for both in, the, in what you use them for. Some manufacturers are not looking at copper as a viable material. One of the things that you need to remember where to use weld through primer, it goes between the welding surfaces, between your mating surfaces. One of the things that we, we teach out there is that where you are actually welding, you want to clean off that weld through primer because it does have a tendency to spatter it. Also with the, your zinc, which is not a very good corrosion protection item as some of the other primers, it is just in the areas that it needs to be removed prior to uh, refinish. Now there is another product on the market that I've seen that has, uh, it's a self-etching zinc weld through primer where it'll actually, you can paint right over it. So, you know, take a look at those items. But there's, but there's some concerns too then. So if you're using these products, it's not just the use of the product on the substrate that you're applying it to, whether it's metal or aluminum or whatever the substrate is, you have to worry about all the surrounding area and protect that from that, that weld through or that penetrating uh, etch primers from accessing areas that are going to be cosmetically seen later. You want to make sure you protect that. Yeah, that's correct. And what's important is there's a sequential order in applying these products. Uh, a lot of times if uh, you're using multiple different products from different manufacturers, confusion can set in where your technician may be doing a step backwards and not in the right sequence. Right, and that confusion comes up when people consider corrosion protection and undercoating as one of the same. They consider those in some instances as the same operation, you're just billing for it twice. And that's, that's not the case. You know, it, the corrosion protection provides that chemical protection to the metal from corrosion invading it. And the undercoating in many cases protects the corrosion protection from any item damaging it and causing some uh, penetration of that coating and affecting the un underneath metal. But we're going back to the process. Corrosion protection is a process that would encompass several steps. The undercoating mm -hmm. could uh, add in cavity wax, could include primers and so forth. It just encompasses the whole area. And like I said, most people look at corrosion protection as a line item. And what the insurance company puts out on your estimate is corrosion protection, but that's not what we as repairers need to do. We need to specify for each particular case what we are putting down there. And I think it's yeah. go over to the consumer, they have an idea that we've protected all of that. And then you also have the liability factor. Uh, we have to offer lifetime warranty on corrosion now. So we need to make sure that we put all of those products back into the process to be able to give that warranty to that person. Right. To Toby's point, you know, diminished value is a huge concern for every consumer. And what happens is in every repair process, it's up to the repair to do their best due diligence to put a vehicle back in the same 
you know, uh, like kind of quality as it was prior to the accident. And corrosion protection is one of those entities that you have to really pay attention to and follow the OEM guidelines on how to restore this particular repair method. So let, let's take weld through primer. Would commonly be one of the first elements of, of corrosive protection properties that you would restore if you're replacing a panel. And so maybe we get the panel back on, we've, you know, we've, we've done our process of weld through primer. One of the next materials that would be used would maybe be an etch primer or a, a 2K epoxy primer or, or maybe a conjunction of both of those. Um, so talk, talk about those, Toby, and, and what they really function to do it within that process. Well, well, there's two categories. Uh, you have your etch primers, which uses a phosphoric acid. Um, the uh, epoxy primer is a catalyzed primer. Uh, the factory e-coat, when we, we remove it, we need to replace it. And the best quality material is an epoxy primer. Uh, the problem in the industry is that guys think that it needs to be sprayed. And so consequently, what they do is they allow the car to go over to the paint department. Um, a better method would be to take it, mix it up, use a little uh, foam brush, brush it on. Let's say you're doing a, a rear body panel to a quarter panel and you've got that seam there. You brush it on, it's dry in 20 minutes. There's no acid you have to worry about contaminating the seam sealer. Put your seam sealer on. So what you've done is created a, a barrier coat so there's no lag time to, when the painter gets for his seam sealer to dry. And we've put that, that coatings back on there that is very similar to the OE application. Um, if you're going to use etch primers, uh, they should be on bare metal. You cannot use them where Bondo is present. Um, you need to allow it to the acid to dissipate before you put any uh, coverings over it, uh, which now can affect your cycle time. So let's talk a little bit about where, where would a, an epoxy primer commonly be used? I know you've got your, your flanges where you're doing a lot of your welding. Maybe you've got your seams, your welded seams, if you're putting a quarter panel on. Um, you could maybe be doing some body work on a panel. You, you may want to use an epoxy on, on the back side or, or in the repair area before your fillers applied in some instances. If you look at uh, the Toyota manual, repair manual, they want epoxy primer down before you put any body filler. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I, I would uh, just use epoxy primer uh, in most of the areas. It, like I said, it dries fairly quick. Right. Um, put it on with a brush. I don't have to wait for the painter to come over and do it. But the, it's, a little, it's a little bit more expensive, right. so you got to take that into consideration. Make sure you charge for it accordingly. And so I know now within the industry there are, you know, you've got your epoxy primer. that It's a two-part. It mixes. But there's also been um, some, some aerosol 2K epoxy primers that I think are becoming more popular within the industry. Do you feel that's a, a viable solution as well in certain sure. situations? Um, it does have a shelf life. It, um, the product that we, uh, Kai and I used, uh, it's good for about four to five days. Um, it can be used on aluminum or can be used on steel. Um, it's not cheap. Uh, because of the me mechanics of the system to get the activator into the uh, material. Right, yeah. So they have a special can for it. Mm -hmm. um, but it is another type of process. Right. Yeah, you have to look at it as a shop owner and a process, as Toby mentioned. Uh, you know, the differences where Toby uh, has suggested that you can make, mix up uh, a two-part epoxy and brush it on. Uh, obviously saves a lot of time moving the vehicle around. You don't have to mask the vehicle for overspray. Uh, it does have its advantages, but it depends on your, your SOPs at your shop. The aerosol can, uh, you know, obviously has a shelf life. You know, if the shop writes the date down on when that activator was started, the, the paint department and the body shop can use that can uh, up to its expiration point, which is kind of based on the temperature. If you're in a colder area, it can last up to two weeks. If you're in a hot climate, four to five days. Uh, it just depends on what works the best for you. Uh, I like to think that if the E-code has been removed, then an epoxy type of primer should be put over that 
area before any type of repair work gets done. Right, but the, the common denominator here is that those materials are not inexpensive. So this type of material, there are individuals who choose to simply put seam sealer over an open seam right after they've welded, right over the e-coat, basically a raw welded seam, sometimes even over a bare metal. And they believe they're doing their part so that when they paint it, the top coated coating looks like it's all been properly sealed up. But the substrate that it's attached to is insufficient. And they've avoided some of the costs that are necessary to truly restore that, that process of putting back the factory corrosion resistance that was engineered into the vehicle. Yeah, I think the, that goes back to the point where the estimator had a tendency in the past to write down one light item. It was undercoating. Yeah. And if undercoating meant corrosion, seam sealer, whatever that was associated with trying to hide the fact that they didn't want the rust to come back. I think what that leads to is what you're pointing out is the technicians has a tendency to skip those methods because obviously, number one, they're not getting compensated for not only in materials, but in labor. So it's a, it's a natural reaction to try and do the job as fast as you can. Another thing, you know, going back to the, um, the aerosol epoxies that are now available, uh, you know, the interesting aspect, just looking at it from a shop standpoint, where with a, a traditional epoxy, you know, you're having to mix and measure that on the scale. And then if you're collecting for that, you're having to bill it based on what's mixed and measured on the scale. Whereas with that aerosol, you know, a lot of times you charge the aerosol to the job, you're using that aerosol for that job. And while there is a, a pot life, so to speak, it's not, <laughs> it's not very long. You know, more than likely, that job's really all you're gonna use that, that sure. can for once, once you pop it. Um, Something you brought up, Toby, that I think is really interesting that, that's lost um, a lot within the industry. These manufacturers want the epoxy before the filler, but most all the filler on the market is, is sold and, and advertised as direct to metal, when in, in reality that, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Um, if you care to elaborate a little bit on that and, and maybe some of the failures that, that could lead um, or could happen from using a filler direct over metal versus having that barrier there of the, uh, the, the epoxy. Well, the biggest problem that you would have when you use direct metal uh, fillers is that you could trap moisture or uh, contaminants in there which could lead to lifting or, or actually corrosion to further it. Uh, again, what is our Bible? And I think is that if we are going to be in uh, we need to be in a position to have somebody back behind us. I'd rather have the OEMs behind me and I'm following their procedures um, instead of, you know, a, well, uh, yeah. some manufacturers, you know, that makes materials that, well, I'll guarantee it. So I think we could all agree that, that a, an epoxy primer is, is maybe suitable is not the word, maybe more required in, in any instance virtually where there's going to be bare metal where the e-coat's been removed. Well, again, if let's say I, I had a, I was doing this a, a, a door and I just was metal finishing it. Um, I could spray some uh, self etch primer on there and you know seal it, and I'd get the same effect. Um, and, you know, understand your products and what the situation is. Um, I'm putting on a, a pre paint of core support. It's all painted. I come in and I welded a few spots there, sand down. I could hit it with some uh, epoxy, pri uh, some self etch primer. Right. And time it got the paint, it's ready to. Right. Then, then go over with a catalyzed oh, sealer. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, I mean, if you understand your products and you have that knowledge, uh, then it, allows, it gives you the toolbox. You know, I tell technicians, you know, you can have metric and you can have SA sockets in your, rent, in your toolbox. Um, they'll interchange, but use the correct one. Right, but it, with, with the OE level of this, right, the consumer, when they purchased that car, they purchased a certain level of durability that the OE engineered into that vehicle, and they purchased a certain amount of safety that the OE engineered into that vehicle. And as a repairer, we have an obligation to not diminish the value of the consumer's purchase and put that vehicle back to as close as possible to what the OEM engineer, engineered that car to be. 
And that means that we have to go through this process of restoring uh, the entire collision resistance that was engineered through a process in that vehicle from when it was manufactured. We're not remanufacturing the car. We're repairing it. And as a, as a result, sometimes those steps are more steps than what the factory went through because we can't dip the car and we can't do some of the operations. So in many cases, it's more steps and more materials and more effort to put that corrosion process or corrosion resistant process back in place. To your point, Tim, one of the key components in the restoring a vehicle is obviously simulating what the repair was prior or the, or the, part, or the, the repair area simulate the prior you know, look of the area. Unfortunately, in the aftermarket, some of the um, products that are available um, don't simulate that in not only application, but in material that's not available to the aftermarket. So, Tim, you know, what you do in your line of business, if a painter took, let's say, an analogy and mixed different products together, obviously those components aren't going to be designed to work the best together. There, there probably will be some type of failure. Corrosion protection is the same way. You know, I caution against mixing materials, maybe purchasing the cheapest materials. Uh, stay with a product brand that's designed to work within itself to get to that stage of, you know, doing your job and protecting the, the repair. A line, a single line of engineered to work together products. Exactly. Yep. I think a lot of think times um, what, what shop owners need to be aware of with most paint manufacturers, if you're not using every bit of that line, say if you use a different primer um, and then you go over with their top coat and then there's ever an issue, they may not warranty that. They may not qualify for their warranty because, again, you haven't used the products that are designed to work with one another. So one of the things that a, a shop really kind of needs to evaluate is within all those processes, how much time is it really taking for each individual process? What's the cumulative total of that time? As well as, what's the expense in materials? And does one line really cover all that expense and, and all that time that's, that's been invested in that? If you're looking for more information on this or other topics, visit us on the web. We're the Society of Collision Repair Specialists, and you can find us at scrs.com.